Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, we're very privileged today to have Dr. Zelinsky um, uh, to visit us and talk about a subject that's really important to all of us. You know, for a long time we've been talking about uh, the importance of uh, the problem of addiction, which is a huge issue in this country and addiction disorder, uh, substance abuse, and so on. And um, uh, really important to figure out ways to address that issue, both from as like all things at biodesign, it's a truly multidisciplinary problem. Everything from uh, you know social and psychological issues all the way down to molecules. Um, and Dr. Zumlinski um, uh, uh, personifies that. Um, she did her PhD at Albany Medical College. Of note, I actually was born in Schenectady, so oh. very familiar with that area. It's like your sibling. Still can't see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but uh, and and as she has been. Um, uh, at San, UC Santa Barbara for many years, where she started as an assistant professor and has now floated all the way to the top of the academic uh, tree there, uh, now full professor there. And um, uh, her research um, really covers a lot of the areas where I just mentioned, specifically um, the glutamate basis of, of addiction disorder, but really looking at uh, substance abuse and many different drugs and many different problems related to that. She's got countless publications and Many awards, I'm not going to go through all of them here, uh, but I think we're all looking forward to hearing about what she's been doing in this space and kind of where, where she sees the field going. So that's it to you. All right, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? No. I'm used to lecturing without a microphone because I, I don't tend to need it. Well, I want to thank you all very, very much for uh, bringing me back to ASU. It's actually, I was trying to think, Janet, when, and I don't even know if you were here, Foster, last time I, I visited. It was seven, eight. It from more like 10. 10 years ago. So it's been a long time. And I tell you, I did arrive at eight o'clock at night and I didn't recognize a lot of things, but now that I'm seeing it in the daytime, I don't recognize it. <laughs> it, is, it is phenomenal. And in part, it's because of these, these gorgeous bio design buildings that are here. So it's, it's truly an honor. I have a lot of dear friends who are here and I hope to make a lot more good friends uh, as I spend the next couple of days visiting. So uh, by way of introduction, I thought we would start off by sort of giving everyone uh, an overview of this issue of this mental disease that we refer to as substance use disorder. And there are a number of criteria that individuals have to meet in order to be diagnosed with this disorder, but these criteria fall under four broad categories. <clears throat> the first being impaired control. And this is impaired control over their drug use, impaired control over uh, their ability to stop uh, using drugs. And this, of course, can contribute majorly to the chronic nature of the disorder. Accompanying this impaired control over one's behavior, particularly their drug taking and drug seeking behavior, comes at a cost. And typically, these costs manifest as social or interpersonal problems, loss of productivity. You no longer go to school, you have problems with your home life, you have problems with your work environment. And these are the kinds of factors that tend to get you in trouble. And if you end up uh, engaging in any sort of illegal activity that can get you in a lot of trouble, you can end up being incarcerated. Another hallmark feature of substance use disorder is risky use. Not only uh, risky in terms of individuals using more drug than intended, but where and how they administer these drugs. Self-administering them in uh, places that are dangerous uh, for survival, for instance. Using rugs of administration, like intravenous rugs of administration, sharing dirty needles, which can contribute to bloodborne uh, diseases, et cetera. And then last, sorry, I got cut off by my little blurry picture here, is dependence upon the drug. And we can see both evidence of physical dependence where the body actually has reactions when the drug is no longer on board, as well as psychological dependence. And what's important to note for folks that don't live in the substance use world is that this notion of psychological dependence, that someone's mental state depends on being on a drug is a relatively new type of criterion uh, for diagnosing this disorder. But anyone who knows anyone suffering from a substance use disorder, I am one of those, I am a recovering smoker, nine years strong, but I'm still in recovery and I still have cravings and thoughts about smoking every once in a while. So far not since I've been here, so that's good. <laughs> but we see these signs of dependence, 
um, manifest as drug tolerance. So individuals are no longer experiencing the same kind of effects that they experienced when they first started drug use. So they start taking more and more drug. That can always uh, set you up for drug overdose. And when the drug is not on board, these symptoms can be very, very robust. So in the case of opioids, if anyone has not seen Train Spotting, the original movie, you must go and watch Train Spotting because it is the most graphic depiction of the physiological reaction an opioid um, person suffering from opioid use disorders body goes through when that drug leaves their system. But not all drugs of abuse cause physiological dependence. They don't cause this real feeling of sick and nausea as the drug leaves their system. Quite a few drugs, in fact, the majority of drugs of abuse cause psychological withdrawal symptoms. And these are characterized by depression, high anxiety, frustration. And these, these emotional reactions, these psychological reactions to not being on the drug contributes majorly to another psychological phenomenon that we refer to as craving, this want or desire to go back out and use that drug again to either relieve those withdrawal symptoms or to gain some sort of type of drug effect. So as we discussed at the outset here, thank you for that very nice introduction, <laughs> substance use disorders is a global problem. And at BioDesign, the whole notion of BioDesign is to try to tackle global problems. And what we know is that substance use disorder directly in terms of diagnosed individuals affects about 2% of the world's population. But when we consider all of the political and socioeconomic impacts of addiction, this truly is seen while we might diagnose more folks with a substance use disorder in more westernized countries, all throughout Asia and all throughout South America, there are major political and socioeconomic impacts of drug trafficking, drug growing and manufacturing, et cetera, that then impacts these countries as well. When we look at the number of folks who die directly from drugs and alcohol, this is through overdoses, we see that relative, whoops, oh dear, sorry, I just like blew away the punchline there. All right, I'm um, sorry, I gotta keep my finger on the pointer, not on the arrows. But we see that relative to other diseases such as cancers and cardiovascular diseases, there's a relatively small percentage of individuals who die directly from drug and alcohol overdoses. I'd like to highlight that smoking, tobacco-related deaths is not included here. However, the chronic use of drugs and alcohol, and we know this well for smoking, can set individuals up for a whole host of other conditions, notably cardiovascular disease, respiratory diseases, digestive diseases, all the way on down, particularly for those of us who live in California, a cigarette butt or a joint flicked out of the window of a car can cause a wildfire that could then end up resulting in folks uh, passing away. So when we take into consideration that all of these other disease states and other types of uh, ways of dying can be affected by an individual or from those with substance use disorders, it becomes very apparent that substance use disorders are one of the leading causes of premature death globally. So what causes substance use disorder? And I wish I had the answer. This is the million dollar question. And to address this kind of question is very, very difficult when we study humans, because a number of factors are known to interact that could set one up set someone up to be more vulnerable to develop a substance use disorder, or actually might make them resilient. I'm actually very interest, interested in what it is that can make some folks resilient. But we do know from epidemiological studies, uh, clinical lab studies, as well as studies in laboratory animals, that there is certainly a genetic component. In fact, there's a very high rate of heritability across substance use disorders, depending on the drug, depending on the study, it ranges anywhere from 25% up to 75%. So it's clearly a genetic basis, but we know for sure it is not a single gene disorder. This is not cystic fibrosis. If it was a single gene disorder, we would have figured it out and we would have corrected the problem by now. So what it's believed to be polygenic, 
We have no idea what the genes are that are mediating vulnerability or, or protection factors, and we have no idea how they interact. But we do know that biological sex, that is your X and Y chromosomes, also play a role in the genetics of substance use disorder. And we're trying to figure out what precisely are on the X and Y chromosomes that might make folks of different biological sexes differentially sensitive to drugs. We know that there's a host of environmental insults, notably trauma, abuse, home and social environment that can all predispose individuals for substance use disorders. And of course, most concerning is these factors have just gone through the roof during the COVID-19 pandemic. And perhaps not surprisingly, but very sadly, so have the rates of drug overdose deaths. And so we know that these environmental factors such as trauma, stress, adversity in home and social environments, they themselves in animal studies and human clinic or lab trials are known to precipitate craving, known to um, increase risk of, of developing a substance use disorder. And we know that these can interact with individuals' genetics. We just don't know how yet. And in addition to these environmental uh, factors, we also know that there's a high rate of comorbidity between substance use disorders and other mental disorders. And in fact, approximately 40% of folks with a substance use disorder have a co-occurring mental illness. And this is very hard to disentangle in the human subject. So we try to model this comorbidity in our animal studies. And in particular, there's pretty significant evidence to implicate high rates of comorbidity with substance use disorders and schizophrenia, both unipolar and bipolar depression, Alzheimer's disease on here for the folks in uh, neurodegeneration. And we're working right now on comorbidity between binge drinking and binge eating disorders. We also know that age matters. Not only does age matter in terms of your propensity to even use drugs in the first place, the younger you are, the more likely you are to be risk-taking and to engage in risky behaviors such as trying drugs for the first time. But your age also can dictate how sensitive you are to various different aspects of the drug experience, whether these be the positive, pleasurable aspects or the negative, aversive aspects that you experience during drug withdrawal. And so this has been a very active area of research at both the human and animal level to look at how your age can influence your sensitivity to drugs and your propensity to consume drugs. And in my laboratory, we've been working not only on that issue, but also particularly this notion that your age might dictate how sensitive you are to the effects of drug withdrawal. Because if you feel terrible during drug withdrawal, you might say to yourself, I don't want to go back through that again. And that might curb your drug use. Or if you are severely, uh, if your brain has been severely damaged because of your previous drug use, you might go through this highly aversive experience and say, it'll end. I'm just going to take drugs again. Or I can make this experience go away. Fine taking drugs again. And so how severe and how one responds to the drug withdrawal effects can have a major influence on the uh, subsequent drug use. So we've been very much interested in that. And more recently, we've been looking at how the age of drug exposure might influence your uh, cognition, in particular looking at working memory and, and spatial learning. So I'm not gonna have a lot of time in this talk to go into any specific details, about the studies that we've been conducting relatively recently, um, but I'm more than happy and I hope I get the chance during uh, our individual meetings and if you see me in the hallway to stop me and I'll be happy to pop up my laptop and show you a bit more of this data. So how do we treat this highly complex disorder? Well, it has been argued that the most effective treatment strategy would be a highly complex one such as this, that is multi-pronged, Targeted, targeting multiple facets of the disorder. With these core features being essential in order for one to have an effective treatment plan. Can we afford 
to have such a plan. Most people can't. Most insurance companies don't cover such a comprehensive treatment plan. And as a consequence, folks suffering from substance use disorder do not get the opportunity to benefit from such a multi-pronged approach, truly genuine individualized medicine. And what I've got highlighted here is pharmacotherapy. And the reason why I'm highlighting it is that it's a core feature of this wonderful treatment plan that we should be able to apply to everyone and help them with their disorder. Except with the exception of perhaps opioids and tobacco, we really don't have any FDA approved pharmacotherapies, certainly not a multitude of them, that we can then attempt to use to facilitate all of these other cognitive behavioral type therapies. And this is particularly true for psychomotor stimulant addiction, which is why I've been very focused on psychomotor stimulants such as cocaine and methamphetamine, because we currently don't have any FDA approved medications targeting the addiction aspect of the disease. We can treat folks with antidepressants, we can treat folks with anxiolytics to try to facilitate the rest of this treatment, but there's nothing special targeting the unique features of those particular disorders. So we can even put a big X over pharmacotherapy for treating certain forms of substance use disorders. This is really, really important, the fact that it is extremely difficult and costly to offer folks this wonderful multi-pronged approach when you consider that 10% of the US population, myself being one of them, are in recovery from substance use disorder of one type or the other. And of those approximately 25 million folks, only about 11% of them are receiving that really awesome specialized treatment in a facility. So that's a lot of individuals who are getting shortchanged in terms of the treatment that could be available to them. And when you look at individuals with comorbid mental disorders, the situation is, is even more grim. Where folks with comorbid disorders, only about 9% of them are getting treated for both conditions, or if there's multiple conditions, and a sliver are getting treated for their substance use disorder alone. <laughs> So what ends up happening? You end up going into some kind of treatment program, whether it's voluntarily because you've decided it's time to stop or because you've been incarcerated and they don't give you a choice, you're gonna stop. And you engage in some fraction of that beautiful picture of treatment and your drug use starts to go down. That is wonderful. You as an individual who's trying to initiate this on your own might say, hey, I'm doing a great job I'm close to being cured, so what do you do? You start slacking off on your treatment. If you're in an outpatient sort of setting, you might even be told, hey, you're doing great. Don't come back every day. Start coming back twice a week. Start coming back once a week. Start coming back once a month. And what you often see is that these drug abuse prevention efforts start to decease. And as you let up on the treatment, the individual then has a very high chance that they're going to relapse. A big issue for me, and certainly not one that I think we're going to tackle with biodesign, is the insurance companies. So apparently, I can cure my smoking addiction in three months with my prescription of Chantix or my prescription of Zyban. Three months is all they covered me for my medication. I have a chronic relapsing disorder. I might need to be on this medication for years. In fact, there has been no study to know how long a smoker needs to be on Chantix or Zyban. But apparently the magic number of three months happens. So then you either pay out of pocket $500 a month for your Chantix or you switch strategies. I have switched strategies. I chew Nicorette's constantly. So if you're wondering what the white thing is blocking around <laughs> in my mouth, it's my Nicorette. <laughs> It's not helping when insurance companies don't recognize addiction as a chronic relapsing disorder, like they do for other mental conditions. And indeed, there's a ridiculously high rate of relapse associated with substance use disorders. With about two thirds of folks, and I've been one of them back in the day when I was an undergrad, 
who relapsed within a week of starting treatment. And the very frightening thing is about 85% of folks relapse within a year of starting treatment. But unlike other chronic relapsing disorders, I have hypertension and asthma down here as an example, we have multiple approaches to try to combat those medical conditions. If this drug is no longer working for you, you person who have, has asthma, well, we're gonna try Dupixit or we're gonna try something new that has come out recently. And we'll see if that can get you back on track. We don't have that luxury with substance use disorders. Certainly not for drugs that are non-opioids. We don't have these kinds of pharmacotherapeutic options. And so plenty of reasons, globally relevant reasons, why you know, we need to do a better job in terms of substance use disorder science and treatment. And given that they're one of the leading causes of premature death, and they can do so by affecting all aspects of your body, I really think a biodesign center focused on substance use disorders is going to create natural bridges with the other biodesign institutes that we have here at ASU. And I'll expand upon that a bit later. But first I thought I would talk about, this is what it used to look like when I was smoking and didn't have children. <laughs> so it's amazing how much weight you put on when you quit smoking and the effects of withdrawal. So I've been at UCSB now for 17 years. It's, it's kind of hard to believe it's, it's been that long. I dye my hair so you don't see all the grays. Um, so what I want to do is just sort of share with you the general approach that uh, I take to studying substance use disorders in my laboratory, where I'm thinking of going in, in uh, upcoming years, and talk about then how I think uh, we should approach uh, addiction science uh, using sort of this multi-pronged approach that I've been trying to apply in my lab for a long time. And uh, like Heather Romanti, I do a lot of neuroscience outreach in, uh, in our community. So basically the goal of my lab is to use rodent models. So I do not study humans. I have never studied humans, but I've been very fortunate to be at other institutions where there are human studies ongoing in parallel with animal studies. And I miss that so much, so much that I will drive on the 101 and the 405 to go to UCLA. Anyone's ever driven on those highways knows you don't do that for fun. And I will drive to UCLA just to have conversations with folks who do human research. So I use rodent models and basically I'm interested in two big questions. What are the consequences for your brain, for your behavior of substance use related behavior, drug taking, and what are some of the causes? Okay, so I'm looking at vulnerability aspects as well as the consequences of repeated drug use. And I basically, as mentioned, focus on a glutamatergic basis for substance use disorders, particularly, and I'm not the only one in this room who does, Wasserola does too, focusing on the prefrontal cortex and how it might regulate subcortical brain structures, like your amygdala controlling emotion, like your nucleus accumbens uh, controlling your motivation and your drive. And I tackle, this issue of glutamate dysregulation by applying various different environmental uh, insults. I look at manipulating genes, how they interact. As I mentioned before, I look across age. And more recently, we've been involved in uh, some sex difference research in this regard. So I like animals to take drugs themselves because we know that self-administered drug causes different changes in the brain than experimental administered drugs, and that's interesting unto itself. So we use a variety of different uh, animal models. We use the gold standard in the field, and that is the classic jugular catheter where the animal would then press a lever or do a nose poke or pull a chain, whatever, and they'll get an intravenous infusion of drug. We also use non-operative conditioning procedures where we simply put the drug on the home cage Here's an example of different concentrations of alcohol, but we do this with methamphetamine, fentanyl, oxycodone, you name it. The only thing that doesn't work is cocaine. Oral cocaine, very low bioavailability. The animals don't, it's like the drink of water. They don't go for it. But all these other drugs, animals will readily just drink it 
in the home cage. So we can look at your duration of drinking and all this sort of thing to uh, get the animals to consume drug. And then we have kind of an in-between model that we apply in mice, because honestly, I've tried doing a jugular surgery. It is not impossible in mice, but someone my age with my vision, I can't do it anymore. So I can't even train someone in how to do it. So what we do is have the animals nose poke or lever press and they'll get liquid truck. So we can use these two uh, paradigms uh, in unison to look at reward and look at reinforcement kind of generally. And after we've allowed the animals to take drug for a period of time, we then look into the brain to see what might have changed. We're not opposed to looking at other parts of the body. If anyone would like other parts of the body, it's just I've been brain focused all my life. And so we look into the brain and we use fairly standard, um, some might even say old school procedures nowadays, where we sample neurotransmitters with microdialysis. We look at relative protein expression with Western blotting or immunohistochemistry. And then you know, just the chemistry helps us map circuits in the brain. And once we've seen changes in specific brain regions, we then determine their functional consequences. Something goes up with BD, it doesn't matter unless you can reverse the behavior by manipulating that protein change. And so we use uh, oral gavage if we have uh, drugs that are used clinically uh, for treating humans, we like to try to give it by oral administration. We inject drugs and we inject drugs into the brain in order to probe their, their relative uh, role in different brain structures. We've done a lot of this over the years, and I don't really have time to go into uh, all of the uh, findings that we've had. But what I just want to highlight to you all is that we've done this with multiple drugs of abuse. As I said, I do have a major focus on psychomotor stimulants because we don't have any pharmacotherapeutics for these disorders but we've also done quite a bit of work with alcohol. And the one finding that I am still incredibly fascinated by, and I don't understand why NIH is not, is that when we look in the nucleus accumbens, that brain region that changes motivation into action, we know is contributing to the drive to take drugs and crave drugs, methamphetamine produces more alcohol-like changes in the glutamate system in this region than does cocaine. And in fact, there's a bunch of glutamate changes that methamphetamine and alcohol cause that are opposite in direction than cocaine. And for me, this is, first off, I want to know why, what is going on here? Because these are both psychomotor stimulant drugs. You know, to the average person, you think, oh, they're going to cause same changes in the brain. Apparently, NIH reviewers think the same thing too. But we know they have distinct pharmacologies, very distinct pharmacologies. We know our bodies handle them differently. So much so mice won't drink Coke, but they'll drink meth because there's different pharmacokinetics. All sorts of things are different between these two drugs. And bam, we've got a brain region where we're seeing differences that we could target therapeutically. And what it really means is stuff that meth is doing might make someone who has comorbid disorder make their cocaine addiction worse and vice versa. So I'm hoping to pursue this uh, in greater detail as we move on. Okay, good. All right. So in discovering how things change, we then go back and try to reverse those changes. And so we've done this again in the context of a lot of different drugs of abuse and these little things that are highlighted here. This is what I'll be talking about tomorrow in psychology. So if you love mTOR signaling and you love group one, the tablature glutamate receptors, and you got nothing else going on tomorrow at 3.30, if you could please come to my talk, I'm going to tell you the whole story of the past seven years of my life and how we've uh, worked to, to this. Um, so yes, we played with a lot of, of different signaling molecules, but most recently, what we've been working on is this enzyme called phosphodiesterase 4B. So folks in immunology, probably know all about phosphodiesterases. So these are enzymes that chew up cyclic A and P and all of this sort of stuff. And we know that they play a role in neural inflammation. And we know drugs of abuse cause neural inflammation. And so sure enough, we decided to um, you know, investigate the role for these enzymes in regulating drug taking behavior. But the real big impetus for us to focus on this specific isozyme 
PDE4B came from a collaboration with a human person. Yes, I need human people in my life. And that human person is Melissa Munchernoff. She is a human geneticist at UNC Chapel Hill. And she studies binge eating disorders. And what she found is doing a GWAS or a series of GWAS studies, grabbing data from all over the world, that there's a single, polymorph single nucleotide polymorphism in the gene for PDE4B that shows up specifically in individuals with binge eating, comorbid with binge drinking disorders. It's not, SNPs not there in binge eating alone, and it's not there in binge drinking alone. So she then approached me as someone who binge drinks in the lab. No, I don't. <laughs> I'm not in the lab, I binge drink. I don't do it in the lab. But who studies binge drinking and said, hey, can we, you know, start working on this and see whether or not this enzyme might be relevant? So then we brought on board a dear friend of mine, Cameron Bryant, who's a binge eating in mouse guy. And so we've been working together to develop an animal model of comorbid binge eating and binge drinking with the ultimate goal of testing whether or not this enzyme is involved. But part of that is just to see whether or not we can regulate anything with a PD4B inhibitor. So super quick, we did a binge drinking study in the home cage. And it's a weird flat dose response curve, I, I completely admit. But we do end up, as I say, de-binging their alcohol intake. We didn't stop them from drinking entirely, but we've lowered their alcohol intake to a point that they're no longer blowing over 0.08. Okay? Here with methamphetamine, you can see, again, this like very, very relatively flat dose response function. But again, this is a drug that can interrupt active binge drinking, as well as methamphetamine self-administration. So now we're working hard to develop this comorbid model of binge eating. We want to see how that influences binge eating and then what happens in an animal that binge eats and binge drinks. And why we're so interested in this is because there are a bunch of FDA-approved, non-selective PDE4 inhibitors out there that are used to treat all sorts of different conditions. And in fact, at UCLA, one of the reasons I take that big drive is that they have a number of phase two clinical trials going on, both with individuals with alcohol use disorder and Laura Ray's lab, as well as for individuals with methamphetamine use disorder. And that's done by Dr. Shoptaw's lab. So, you know, this might be a potential class of drugs, these PDE4 inhibitors, that could be repurposed for treating addiction. And we just have to wait and see those results of the clinical trials. But in the meantime, we're going to trudge ahead with our animal studies to see whether or not more, non, more selective, less side effect inducing drugs might also be uh, worthy of pursuing. And then hopefully to work with a medicinal chemist to try to design something that's nice and bioavailable, et cetera. So that's causes, or sorry, consequences and treatment of disorders. The other aspect of my lab focuses on those factors that might induce vulnerability. And so with that, we do uh, a lot of genetic work. I am not a geneticist. I do not know how to make a knockout mouse or anything like that. I don't know how to read GWAS or, or anything, but I'm really darn good at assaying behavior in these animals. So what we do use a number of approaches that quite often may intersect, where we might look at different completely unrelated strains of mice, to see, you know, maybe one drinks more, like this guy, drinks more alcohol than this guy over here. What's different between those two strains? Or sometimes we look at ones that are more, more related, but genetically distinct. And we do a lot of work in these 129 mice with opioid drugs. If folks make me a knockout or transgenic mouse, I'm happy to study it. And I've had a lot of collaborations over the years uh, studying various different mice. And I've also had lots of collaborations where I use uh, viral mediated gene targeting to either reverse that knockout mouse or to knock down or increase various different proteins in different brain regions. And sometimes concomitant with this genetic work, we of course apply all sorts of different environmental manipulations. The big one being prior drug experience. And in those kinds of studies, we look across age, and we do it in our, not in our humans, I'd love to do it in humans, 
uh, but we're doing it in our animals. So we've got studies where we looked at juvenile drug exposure. That's a lot of fun, trying to inject little juvenile uh, mice, all the way up to big old chubby 18-month-old senior mice. And we're actively involved in, in this kind of work, looking at middle, I wonder why, middle age and, uh, and, and older adulthood. We also, as I said, have this binge eating experiment going on, looking at comorbidity. And over the years, I've done a number of collaborative work looking at different stressors. So with my husband, Todd Kippen, looking at prenatal stress and how a utero stress exposure might predispose you to take drug. And then with a friend of, of Foster's of mine, Hosanna Camerini in Brazil, we uh, did some work with chronic unpredictable mild stress. So in that regard, we've made some major advances. An important one is that for all of these vulnerability factors that we glean from the clinical literature and the epidemiological literature to promote addiction vulnerability, they appear to promote addiction vulnerability in our animal models. So they have very, very high predictive validity. And I think that's really, really important for the field. And I will probably not have time because I'm looking at the clock here uh, to go over some of our cool data that we have from looking at binge drinking during uh, younger life versus later life and the cognitive consequences of that. But I brought my laptop, so I'm happy to, to show some of that data to you all. But one uh, paper I really want to highlight because I think it really encapsulates my whole general research goal and my, my approaches is this one that came out in uh, 2017. So it's already five years old. And this is a, probably, I'd say, not only because it's like one of the best titles I've come up with ever. Uh, mind you, I wanted it to be the glue, the bad and the ugly. And biological psychiatry said, you can't abbreviate in the title. <laughs> I'm like, the glue, the glue, the bad and the ugly. That's just <laughs> Anywho, um, but what's really awesome about this paper for me personally is that it summarizes 11 years worth of work in the lab, which started with my undergrad student who moved with me to South Carolina or to uh, Santa Barbara, my first graduate student, and at the time, the graduate, most senior graduate student in my lab who just defended uh, in December. So this is a lot of work by a lot of folks in my lab. And what we did in this uh, paper was just simply ask the question, is there a relationship between glutamate signaling in the nucleus accumbens and the propensity to take methamphetamine? And we tackled this question a number of different ways. One was we injected the animals. We did it ourselves. We injected the animals to see how does methamphetamine change your brain? And believe it or not, at this time when we ran this study, nobody had looked at low dose methamphetamine administration. Folks had looked at neurotoxic doses of methamphetamine, multiple injections a day, 10 milligrams per kilogram, and that sure as heck blows up your glutamate system and that contributes to neurotoxicity. But no one had really looked at how glutamate changes to these quote unquote recreational drug doses. So we went ahead and did that study. And about the same time, our collaborator, Tamara Phillips up at OHSU had designed selected lines of mice that were either high methamphetamine drinking or low methamphetamine drinking. So we got our hands on some of those mice. They were drug naive. And we said, hey, let's look at their glutamate system. Let's see what they look like. And lo and behold, they had a number of glutamate anomalies in their nucleus accumbens that looked like a guy who had had repeated treatment. And they never had drugs before. So then as a complementary approach, we were running a place conditioning experiment. So this is where you pair a drug with a certain environment. And after you do that a bunch of times, you ask the animal, hey, you're drug free, where would you like to go? In the environment where you got drug or the other environment where you got nothing. If an animal likes the drug experience, we interpret, uh, any sort of approach behavior is the animal saying, hey, I liked it here. I want to hang out. They didn't like the experience. They will avoid it. Okay. And they'll hang out in the other side. <coughs> so we were doing the study of place preference. And we were going to go in and we were going to block some glutamate signaling. And we start running the animals. And we notice 
that there's about 10% of our animals, everyone's getting the same dose. Everyone's going through the same procedure. And they would keep showing this very, very strong place aversion. Very strong. And then as is classic for this, you get a whole bunch that don't show preference or aversion and they're ambivalent, they're in the middle. And then the majority of guys were showing a place preference. Well, we wanted to block a place preference. So I'm like, well, what are we gonna do with these aversion guys? You know, what are we gonna do with these neutral animals? We should do something, we should collect their brains. And so we did, we ran about a hundred mice and we got all of their brains. And what we found, so these are all the same drug treatment, just expressing different behaviors, is the animals that for some reason or another, like that treatment, showed increases in these metabotropic glutamate receptors that I study and these homer proteins. So we have three pieces of converging evidence to suggest that this glutamate abnormality or jacked up glutamate system in the nucleus accumbens may be a major trigger for methamphetamine addiction vulnerability. And so that's just one, one example of how we can bring, or we have brought things together in the laboratory. What I also try to do on top of look at drug taking behavior is look at other behavior abnormalities that be, can be caused by drugs of abuse. And in this regard, we do a lot of studies of emotionality, looking at anxiety-like and depressive-like behaviors. I look at self-grooming. Uh, so for the uh, Alzheimer's folks, here is a well-type mouse after swimming in some water. You see he is taking care of himself. He's all dry and groomed. And then here's your Alzheimer's guy. This is the TG3X mouse. Not so good at taking care of himself. And these guys are just starting to show signs of cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment. But you can clearly see they're not taking care of themselves. And this is what we see in the clinical scenario. Likewise, when you look at their nesting behavior, that's the wild type mice, they're a bunch of, these are males. They don't, know, they don't make the best nest, but they're, they're tearing it apart, they're trying to make it fluffy. And then you have the so-called Alzheimer's transgenic mice, you know, just peeing on the pad. They're not ripping it up or making a nest or anything. So we try to look at how self-care might interact with drug experience, how drug experience might interact with self or cause changes in self-care. That's just another index. And then of course we do uh, some cognitive behavior in particular more recently with older age drinking uh, studies. And for this, I want to thank Heather Belmonte, who during our uh, postdoc actually trained me in how to do Morris maze and radial alarm maze. And thanks to that, these are procedures that I continue to use in my lab today. And so, I'm close, I'm gonna go really fast. This is my old age study, and Ramon needs to see this because he hasn't seen this data yet. He's gonna look at the brains for me. <laughs> so what we've got here is uh, drinking behavior, in six month old black six mice and 18 month old black six mice. At the time we did this study, we didn't know if 18 month old B6 mice would binge drink alcohol. And in fact, they do. Their alcohol intake is lower than the younger mice. Look at their blood alcohol levels. Okay, so they're metabolizing alcohol more slowly. So they have those high blood alcohol levels, even though they drink a little bit less. And so we let them drink for a month. And then, and for, oh, I want to point out too, you notice how the drinking kind of goes up and down and that we don't see this in young adult mice. Young adult mice, this procedure is steady, steady, steady binge drinking. So this is whole something that I, I want to figure out why it's going up and down like that. But after they did the drinking, we tested them in anxiety and don't hurt yourselves going through all of this. I'll tell you right now, we saw evidence of alcohol withdrawal induced anxiety, but it was no different from what we had seen in younger animals. So once you reach young adulthood, if you engage in binge drinking behavior, when you stop drinking, you will experience anxiety and the magnitude of that anxiety really does not appear to get worse with age. So that's one good thing for those of us who are in middle age. However, this was a big study. I'm gonna focus only on experiment three over here. We then tested them in a Morris water maze and a radial arm maze. We'll start with the Morris water maze. Actually, we can look at both of these columns all together. And you notice how many brackets of females only have popped up. 
we found a lot of female-only deficits in cognition while we were doing this experiment. And not once did we see a male selective deficit. This is intriguing. This fits with the clinical literature that females tend to be more prone to cognitive impairment than males. And interestingly, we didn't see an age difference in the study where we com um, compared six months to 18 month old mice. That's experiment three. Saw really no difference in the level of cognitive impairment caused by alcohol. Alcohol impaired Morris Watermay's performance equally in those two age groups. But then you put in the radial arm maze and something really interesting happened. And I still did, this took me forever to put this graph together because I couldn't believe it. Six month old binge drinkers, primarily or a couple of times female selectively, had a cognitive deficit on the radial arm maze that was so severe, it was like an 18 month old mouse. Intriguingly, 18-month-old mice did not show alcohol, an additional alcohol-induced impairment. So if you haven't started binge drinking yet in your life, wait until you're much, much, much older <laughs> because apparently your working memory will be spared. But this is fascinating. So we now have evidence that drinking during mature adulthood can predispose you to early cognitive decline and the job that Ramon's going to have is to help us work through the brains of these guys to see whether or not we can come up with some, some biomarkers that correlate with the behavior. So with that, I should probably move on and talk about what I'm thinking here in terms of a biodesign institute. And as you see from the work that I have done is that my work is all animal focused. But the places where I have been most happy and most excited to be have been places where animal behavior or animal studies are being conducted in parallel with human research. And that's really, really what I envision a biodesign center to be. I would like to see folks working cooperatively on issues of substance abuse, vulnerability, and resilience. We have black mice, we have white mice, we have brown mice, we have yellow mice, but they're not the same as folks who are of different races. So we can't in our animal models necessarily look at race, at ethnicity, or even gender in terms of vulnerability factors and all of that. However, human researchers can, and if they come up with biomarkers that might predict vulnerability or resiliency, we can take those biomarkers back to our animals, try them on different background screens and see how does that protect or worsen the condition in our animals. Pathology, looking at it on multiple levels, ranging from behavior down to the molecular. And a big one for me is the development and implementation of treatment approaches, whether they be pharmacological, immunological, behavioral, and certainly trying to put these together in a personalized medicine sort of approach. And so what's also very important to me is that we not only forward translate discoveries regarding mechanism to finding a target, to developing tools, and eventually getting them in the patient, but back translating information we glean from the parents. Like I was saying, in terms of biomarkers that end up associating vulnerability related to race with substance use disorder. What does that mean? Can we probe how that is true in terms of mechanism? And can we use that information to develop better therapies and tools? And this is the place to do it because you already have biodesign centers that are focused on these very issues, not in the context of substance use disorders, but that's our job as a biodesign center on substance use disorders is to try to make these connections. And I'm so happy that I've got so, well, I'm happy I've got so many meetings, but you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. that I get to meet so many folks from many of these, these different centers, because for me, there's just a natural bridge on the mechanistic side and on the therapeutic side. And of course, as you know, because you guys are all doing it, 
that there's a lot of opportunity to then liaison with the folks who are actually in contact with the patients, whether it be through Mayo, I left Mayo up here, Banner Health, through the gang in clinical psychology, who have a number of really exciting programs where they're reaching out to uh, treatment centers, reaching out to the community, and this is the right place to have this happen. And so with that, you know, I was basically told I get to hire some people. <laughs> so great. <laughs> one of them is not going to be my husband. So we'll, we'll have to talk about that one later. <laughs> but, so who do I want to hire? Who, you know, who's missing from my life? There's a lot of people missing from my life. And I put down examples here because some of you might recognize some of these names. So it sort of helps you envision where I'm thinking. But what I would love to see are two behavioral geneticists. One who focuses on humans, one who's familiar with animals. They have to have expertise in substance use disorders to, you know, create that, that foundation for this. And like my collaborator, Melissa, is uh, one such person. And there's quite a few excellent uh, behavioral geneticists out there. All have wonderful jobs, are not likely to come. But I'm looking for someone who's either been trained by these labs uh, or has similar research skills. Then I see at the pathology level, someone who does brain imaging. It can be in both human and laboratory animals. And if you were not aware, apparently ASU, according to the guys who have the MRIs uh, on, at UCSB, that ASU has one of the world's leading small animal imaging centers here. And folks at, in Santa Barbara are jealous <laughs> of the imaging center that you guys have. So I could see parallel brain imaging work, but I'd like to go a little bit deeper because we can in the animal and try to find someone who does a lot of functional uh, neurocircuitry sort of work. So we get the level of circuits because there's plenty of us out there right now. We already have us on campus who can do the molecular stuff. And then what I'd like to see sort of on the animal side is someone who is really, really committed to developing new addiction uh, related therapies. So medicinal chemist or someone involved in nanotechnology or nanomedicine. And I've got some examples of folks here who have worked in the drug field or in the um, autism field who are you know, doing this sort of thing, taking these drugs that you know, have numbers and stir that and turning it into something we might actually be doing in humans and then having someone who actually engages in phase two clinical trials so that we can apply the knowledge that we get from here into the, the clinic. And so that's just, you know, without meeting everyone and knowing what all's going on here, I think having a little framework like this, most of the six people, not five, um, on here <laughs> uh, would really, really, I think, solidify and create a nice foundation for future collaboration. And with that, I am done. Sorry, I guess yeah, we have time for questions. Right, I know we have the microphones that come over here. It's okay, I can. Yeah, you so can. do you, uh, are on. there any ex vivo tissue models or in vitro models to study these signaling pathways of for addiction? Because you emphasize on mouse models and what are your perspectives on that? So uh, there are actually, um, so uh, there's a couple of labs, like say we know Justin Chandler uh, and um, Jeremy Siemens in medical, he's no longer at Medical University of South Carolina, but you can do organotypic cultures where you take a bit of the prefrontal cortex, take a bit of the accumbens, they'll start forming um, connections. You can record electrical activity from those. You can also then take those cells out and run them even single cell PCR if you, you wanted to. The issue there is you're not, capturing the entire brain and the complexity of all the circuitry and all the neurotransmitters. But no, there are folks that are actively looking at, so they'll take, make these organotypic cultures, either from animals who are drug experienced, or they'll take them from young mice and add drugs to them, to then bathe them, and then they can determine whether or not there's some, you know, similar signal. Other questions? I'll just ask. I don't even mic. It's fine. Uh, great job, Karen. That was that was awesome. 
Very good work. I'm just curious. So in the neurodegenerative field, we have brain banks, right? Where patients, Alzheimer's disease, for example, available so we can study proteins or RNA um, sequencing. Is this exists for substance abuse? And do you foresee being able to use those uh, in, the, in the future? Yes, they do exist. They're not as extensive as the ones for neurodegenerative diseases, but they do exist. Um, I would love to. I would love to have clearance to do that. Um, but currently my lab is not equipped with the personnel and, and all the biosafety and everything that goes into it. But no, that is, ex the fact that you guys do that already here makes it easier for us to try to establish something along those lines for brains of individuals with alcohol use disorder and all of that. So no, there's definitely, there's brain banks at UCLA, there's brain banks up in New York, there's probably, there's probably more than I'm aware, but those are ones that are coming to, to my head first. I'm gonna take a prerogative. So um, so I know you said you weren't a geneticist. Um, I, I come from the cancer field um, and there are inherited disorders in cancer. They're not common, but we learn a lot because of even just a single gene that can lead to a huge increase in the rate of cancer. So I'm kind of getting, I'm kind of interested to know, A, are, are, are there such things in, 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 in substance use disorders where, you know, there's like, you know, clear familial inherited patterns where we could learn something about that. And even if the, in the GWAS studies, my term with GWAS studies is that they, they lead to an increased risk, but it's like a 15% increase risk or 20 It's hard to kind of get a sense of, so I'm trying to get a sense of what we know from all that. Yeah, I'm trying to think, I'm sure there is, but for instance, you know, when they've looked at uh, familial alcoholism, this is where, where things have been done, they haven't come up with that one gene, but there are families in Finland, mm -hmm. um, so socially isolated areas, uh, actually there's smoking studies done in uh, northern Quebec, up mm -hmm. in Canada, quite a bit of inbreeding going on mm -hmm. in, in these areas where they've been starting to track phenotype with the uh -huh. video and making the pedigrees and all of that. So far, to the best of my knowledge, but there's lots of drugs out there and I don't study all of them, that there might be a gene or two that has, has popped up. Does that land in like the glutamogermic pathways? Or so where the, the, the really convincing story comes in, looking at familial drug use is Ketamine sensitivity. Mm. Ketamine's an MDA blocker, yeah. right? We, we use it to anesthetize ourselves. Um, and individuals with a family history positive, even if they're not suffering from an alcohol use disorder, they are family history positive, mm. have a differential reaction to ketamine than those who are family history negative. So there's something going on with the NMDA receptor, and that's fascinating because that's a target of alcohol. Mm. Alcohol blocks that receptor in the brain. So there's stuff there. There is stuff linking the glutamine, but hammering it down mm -hmm. to the gene and all of that, we're not there. But what I think is very interesting, and again, why I miss having clinical folks around, is you saw all my the enzymes that I'm studying. Yeah. Mentor, PI3K, all that. These are, these are cancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cancer targets. And guess what? I've got review papers this thick on all the clinical trials that are going on for cancer, mm -hmm. what signaling molecules are targeted, what phase of clinical trial are these drugs in or have they completed? And in fact, the story I'm telling tomorrow, we grabbed an older one, but at least it's been on the market and used for treating cancers and tumor rejection for a long time. But I looked at those tables from the cancer work to try to see, all right, hey, he's not the cleanest drug, he's a little bit dirty, but we know PI3K is up, we know ERK is up, mm -hmm. we know PK, all of these things are up. And hey, here's a clinically FDA approved drug. Mm -hmm. We could put it into people. And, and, and these are the patterns that are elevated in the brain? In the brain. And so do they cross the bullet brain barrier? Those signaling molecules Those or the drugs? That's the big thing. Yeah, yeah. So you have to find ones that target aromas and yeah, the yeah. brain stuff. And there are some of them. Mm. Right now, the one drug I study, Everolimus, is nasty drug, lots of side effects, probably not what we'd want to go give to everybody suffering from a substance use disorder, not now, but there are newer generation drugs that have higher permeability. So what we do in the event that we're not sure, 
if let's say ERK is up in the, the animal, we pre-treat systemically or orally, and if ERK goes down, mm -hmm. well, presumably that drug is getting into right. the brain, and that's how we can program that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you kept mentioning neuroinflammation and your work is fascinating but i don't look yet at neuroinflammation do you ever see true macrophage t cell we haven't looked and this is part of you know what i am i'm hoping you know if, if this works out great if it doesn't work out i still would like to um to talk to folks and maintain collaborations with individuals because I dropped out of immunology class in fourth year. <laughs> I didn't like the students I was with. They were all like med school wannabes and it was a fun based learning class. And I came up with an idea and they all poo pooed me and I go, no, this is fun based learning. We're supposed to be working together. I said, yeah, I don't need this to graduate. I'll graduate psych with a bio minor instead of bio psych. So I am not an immunologist, but you guys are. <laughs> right. So there is, I mean, I've been reading the literature, obviously, in, in, in prepping up for, for starting this work on, on neuroimmunology and inflammation. And Janet's lab has been moving in that direction, too. And she knows a heck of a lot more about it than I do, um, as do her students. Um, but there's definitely evidence of everything. All your, all your pro-inflammatory cytokines go up. Your anti-inflammatory cytokines go down. You've got NF kappa B. You've got everything. The, the macrophages are going on in. Microglia are going on in. And so the big question, which is what we proposed in our grant, is for the animal aim, is all of these guys, including PDE4B, they're expressed in all sorts of cell types. They're in neurons, they're in astrocytes, they're in microglia. And we don't understand enough yet about how these different things go awry in a binge or learning, in a binge drinking model or a binge eating model. So we're proposing to use different kinds of viruses to target and use a lot of immunohistochemistry to try to figure out you know, who's changing what, where, when. But in terms of B cells and T cells and all of that, I that's not my forte. So, so we can talk. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, let's thank you once again. That was all right. Well,